no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. The vast expanse of the cosmos has always been a source of wonder. And today, we're diving deep into one of the most tantalizing promises to humanity. This is the island of Maui in the U.S. state of Hawaii. And it has been burning. Fires this big had been quite rare in Hawaii, with most people worrying about the active volcano on the big island. But the beautiful and historic town of Lahaina, which I visited almost 30 years ago as a teenage marine, has now been reduced to ash. Several things contributed to these fires. Human development and invasive species are two of them. But the third is drought. I know that some of you don't think the evidence of global warming is clear. And while I respect your skepticism and know there is a lot of misinformation to the contrary, our false beliefs do not change the laws of the universe. Climate change is real, and if humanity wants to prevent even greater catastrophe, we need fusion, and we need it now. Luckily, companies around the world are working to make this futuristic technology a reality. I have great hopes for the MIT Spark Tokamak reactor and the Helion reactor. However, while these reactors can find hot plasma using powerful magnetic fields, there might be a better way. HB11 Energy is an Australian company founded in 2017 and has its roots in research conducted at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. The approach to fusion that the company is working on was developed from research in the fields of lasers and nuclear physics at UNSW. The foundational work behind HB11's approach was largely driven by Professor Heinrich Hora. Professor Hora has been a prominent figure in the field of lasers and plasma physics for decades. Born in Czechoslovakia, he is described as a German-Australian now. He received a degree in physics from the Martin Luther University in Halle-Wittenberg, Germany in 1956, and a doctorate degree from the Friedrich Schiller University. In 1981, the University of New South Wales, Australia, awarded him the Doctorate of Science degree. In 1991, he was awarded the Edward Teller Medal. Those of you who have seen the movie Oppenheimer will have seen Mr. Teller depicted prominently. Dr. Teller gave humanity its first high-energy fusion reaction in the form of the hydrogen bomb. Dr. Hora also won the Dirac Medal in 2001. Everyone loves Paul Dirac for his discovery of antimatter, without which the Enterprise's engines couldn't possibly work. Dr. Hora's theoretical work with powerful lasers suggested that they could be used to induce fusion without the need for high temperatures, leading to the concept behind the formation of HB11. Recognizing the potential of this technology, HB11 Energy was subsequently formed to commercialize this unique approach to fusion. Instead of heating fuel to the point of fusion, as in traditional methods, HB11's method involves the use of lasers to initiate fusion. By focusing powerful lasers onto a target, they aim to accelerate hydrogen nuclei, protons, into boron-11 nuclei, triggering the fusion reaction. Fusion reactions involve combining light atomic nuclei to form heavier nuclei, releasing a tremendous amount of energy in the process. Let's compare the energy outputs of the most common fusion reactions with the HB11 proton-boron reaction. First, we will look at deuterium-tritium fusion, which releases 17.6 mega electron volts in the form of four helium nuclei and a neutron, all traveling at high speeds. This is the most widely researched fusion reaction because it has the highest cross-section, which means the probability of occurring at the temperatures achievable with current technology. As indicated, it releases 17.6 mega electron volts of energy per reaction, predominantly carried away by the high-speed neutron. This is the reaction that tokamaks like Spark and Niter will use. 
Next, we will look at deuterium-deuterium fusion. The deuterium-deuterium fusion reaction can proceed via two main pathways. One produces 3.3 mega electron volts and creates three helium nuclei and a neutron. The other can produce four mega electron volts and produces tritium and a proton. It's important to note that we cannot yet control which of these reactions take place, and that in the deuterium-deuterium fusion environment, the produced tritium would subsequently react with deuterium, leading back to the deuterium-tritium reaction mentioned above and releasing 17.6 mega electron volts, again carried away by the high-speed neutron and proton in these reactions. This is the first reaction that helion energy is pursuing in their reactor. Now let's look at the proton-boron reaction, which is HB11's focus. This type of reaction hits a stationary boron atom target, producing three high-speed helium-4 nuclei, also called alpha particles, and no neutrons, with a total energy of plus 8.7 mega electron volts, which is divided among the three helium nuclei produced. In energy output, the deuterium-tritium reaction releases the most energy per event at 17.6 mega electron volts, followed by proton-boron, at 8.7 mega electron volts, and then the primary deuterium deuterium reaction at 3.3 and 4 mega electron volts. But when we look at neutron production, the deuterium deuterium reaction always produces neutrons, which can lead to radiation damage in reactor components and the activation of materials, meaning materials become radioactive. Neutron radiation is some of the deadliest radiation known. The proton boron 11 reaction, being a neutronic, doesn't produce these problematic neutrons. While the deuterium tritium reaction releases the most energy and has the highest fusion cross section at achievable temperatures, it comes with the challenges of neutron production, and tritium is a very rare and expensive isotope of hydrogen. The proton boron 11 reaction, despite its lower energy release, offers the benefits of being a neutronic making it much safer for humans to be around, and obviating the need for heavy shielding. Meaning we could use these in personal vehicles and spaceships, and potentially allowing for direct energy conversion. Making two things with the same charge get close enough to each other for the very short-range strong nuclear force, which exists between quarks and is carried by gluons, to kick in and overpower the electromagnetic repulsion is very difficult. But HB11 thinks they have the solution. Using their high power lasers to create a beam of protons with extreme acceleration, these lasers are so intense and focused that they can give protons enough kinetic energy to overcome this repulsion facilitating fusion. HB11's energy method is distinct from the common magnetic confinement or inertial confinement methods, and it does not rely on the very rare and expensive fusion fuels that traditional reactors use, like tritium and helium 3. The HB11 reactor uses the cheap and abundant fuels depicted in its name. By avoiding the usual method of heating a plasma to extreme temperatures, they can also make the reactor much, much smaller. If you ever hope to see something like this in your lifetime, a neutronic direct energy fusion is the only way to go. Since the output from this fusion reaction consists mainly of charged particles, specifically helium nuclei, we can use magnetic fields to turn their kinetic energy directly into electrical energy bypassing the need to convert heat energy into mechanical energy and then into electrical energy, leading to a much more efficient energy capture process. Now other fusion systems like the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California also uses lasers in a fusion process known as inertial confinement fusion. This reactor needs a tiny gold pellet filled with deuterium and tritium, which is then hit with 192 powerful lasers all focused on the pellet. These lasers heat and compress the pellet to conditions extreme enough for fusion to occur. The process involves creating a hot spot in the center of the pellet that ignites and leads to a fusion burn wave through the surrounding fuel. This fusion reaction produces helium nuclei, which are called alpha particles, and neutrons, which is why you will never see one of these operating without heavy shielding. And again, it needs gold and tritium to work. So even though both the HB11 and the NIF use lasers, they are vastly different in potential. 
According to HB11, their unique approach bypasses many of the challenges facing traditional fusion methods. By not relying on high temperatures or pressures and expensive reactants, they avoid many of the complexities and potential risks plaguing other designs. Using solid-state laser systems, the proton accelerators could be made very small. And direct energy conversion allows this type of reactor to possibly be practical for land, air, and small space vehicles. Let's look a little closer at direct energy conversion. The primary products of the proton-boron fusion reaction are charged helium nuclei, also called alpha particles again. And, unlike other fusion reactions that emit high-energy neutrons, the aneutronic fusion produces almost exclusively charged particles. This absence of neutrons is crucial for HB11's direct energy conversion process. The reactor is designed with electric and magnetic fields in such a way that the high-energy alpha particles produced by the fusion reactions are directed and harvested. As these charged particles move through the electric magnetic fields, they induce a current. The induced current from the moving charged particles can be captured directly as electrical energy. This direct energy conversion means that the kinetic energy of the alpha particles can be harvested before it's randomized into thermal motion, which is what we call heat. This is not technically cold fusion, a term usually used to describe lattice fusion. And while this is usually called non-thermal fusion, I would rather we call it cool fusion. The lack of free neutrons also means that there's a reduction in the activation of reactor materials. Activated materials become radioactive and can pose safety and waste disposal concerns. Another outstanding advantage of this type of fusion. As of 2021, HB11 had reported some experimental successes. And while it's essential to recognize that developing a commercially viable fusion reactor is a massive challenge, HB11 just received a $1.7 million federal research grant from the Department of Energy. In summary, while all fusion reactions release energy, the way this energy is managed, harvested, and converted into useful work can vary significantly based on the fusion approach. While the deuterium-tritium fusion reaction is currently the front-runner in fusion research due to its higher cross-section and easier achievability, the high neutron fluxes these reactors generate present challenges in terms of materials, safety, and waste management, limiting the use of these systems outside of massive power stations. The HB11 fusion reactor design seeks to directly harness the kinetic energy of non-thermal aneutronic fusion, and if they succeed, the dream of almost limitless carbon-free energy, sufficient to power us throughout the solar system, will finally be a reality. Something to think about. Thanks for listening, and stay safe at Astro Proterra. Warren, um, first, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to the student. This is really appreciated. Pleasure. Yeah. Uh, before we go into the thick of it, uh, I would like to say how impressed I am by what you've achieved in the last month or so, months or so. You've raised a lot of money for uh, an opportunity that is far-reaching uh, far and future-looking in the Australian context where raising money is not easy. So, hat off to that. Thanks. Uh, but before we go into this, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You're a, you're a UNSW graduate? Yeah, so I, I studied material science at, at UNSW. Um, went towards the end of my undergraduate i started a, a business degree so a master's in commerce i wanted to do an mba but you needed experience for that um, straight after undergraduate I, I did phd with the business degree in parallel uh, because i was always always interested in in the i guess applying science rather than just leaving it to scientific journals mm -hmm. after that i did a, a postdoc at trinity college in dublin and naturally while my position was research uh, having a business degree, you're naturally drawn to other things like yep. uh, we, we did the groundwork for a company there and also uh, built an electron microscopy facility um, called the Crayon Advanced Microscopy Laboratory. Okay. Uh, came back, uh, did a little bit more work at UNSW, but still at UNSW, uh, did seven years at the Australian National Fabrication yeah, Facility. Yeah, that's how we met. That's how we met. Mm -hmm. uh, do, doing little cl some collaborations on diamonds. So we did a... 
uh, after my PhD, I uh, did a, uh, a postdoc uh, position for two years at Trinity College in Dublin, uh, where, amongst other things, uh, established an advanced microscopy facility because naturally, uh, if you have a business degree as well as research, mm -hmm. you're drawn to everything other than doing research. Mm -hmm. Coming back to Australia, I spent seven years at the Australian National Fabrication Facility. Um, so that's a network of nano fabrication labs. So mm -hmm. anything and everything nanotechnology. And my job was industry interactions. So yeah. helping companies yeah. benefit from new science uh, amongst a, a network yeah. of researchers. So your the current initiative that we're going to discuss is a natural continuation of this industry collaboration that you've been bathing in for the last few years at the ANFF? Essentially, yes. Yeah, okay. With a lot of really, really high profile scientists okay. in my network who are great to, who we will be collaborating with. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of them will play a role in the future of this. Absolutely. This okay, so the, the venture is called HB11. Yep. Am I saying it correctly? HB11 Energy. Yeah, uh, and it's about fusion. Nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Tell me, tell me more about what is the problem that HB11 wants to solve before we talk about the uh, before we talk about the technology. Well, uh, it's uh, only in the last couple of years have we seen students taking to the streets in rallies and being allowed to take time off to protest for new energy sources. So carbon emissions don't contribute to climate change, which which contributes to all of the devastating consequences which have been predicted from, from climate change. So now more than ever, there is absolutely a need for a new energy source. And this is a, a, a shot at it. This is a shot at it. What's wrong with the existing technologies? In brief, you know, succinctly. Well, I mean, obviously fossil fuel uh, sources create, create carbon emissions. Uh, the alternatives to... Because uh, we have a lot of alternatives like uh, wind and solar power... Yeah. Etc. So, so diving into the energy market, something that I've learnt uh, quite quite well is that there are two main uh, sources of power, at least that are integrated into the grid. There's the intermittent ones, which renewables uh, suit really well, and then there's baseload power. Baseload. Renewables are fantastic when the sun shines or the wind blows, but when the sun shines and the wind doesn't blow, unless you've got batteries to back that up which is quite an inefficient way of managing your electricity uh, they just don't cut it and as far as the total power that's required they okay. also don't cut it so nuclear fusion could be a contributor to the base correct the base load so, power the base load power okay um, this is a course about entrepreneurship we're not going to delve into science a lot but i think we should cover it because it's engineering okay so tell me more hb11 what does it mean uh h is for hydrogen yep. b is for boron mm -hmm. That the hydrogen boron fusion reaction, specifically the hydro, hydrogen boron 11, so the 11th isotope yep. uh, of boron, is the reaction that we're looking for, that, that we're chasing. Okay. Now, the very nice thing about it is that boron can, is abundant, it can be mined uh, in my kitchen. You know, there's probably a few kilograms. Is, is boron, boron 11 the main isotope, or there's. 80% of natural boron is okay. boron 11. Okay. Yeah. So well, it's not all of it, it's, it's, it's certainly most of it. So it's abundant. Um, the products of the reaction are not radioactive. So in essence, while it's nuclear power, it doesn't have any of the downsides of uh, either regular nuclear uh, power where the byproducts take decades, millennia to, to decompose. Um, and and the, the, the sourcing of the fuels is also not a problem. Okay. I'll be the devil's advocate. There's no catch. Of course, there's a catch. It's a science project. <laughs> By definition, it's a, if a sci it's a science project, we may come across scientific hurdles. Yeah. What's critical about this, though, is that all other fusion approaches, which have promised to be have to to deliver a new source of energy, have all focused on thermal fusion. So specifically, yeah. that carries the enormous technical challenges of heating fuels to hundreds of millions of degrees. Now, the reason why the hydrogen boron reaction hasn't been considered is the temperatures that you need to achieve for a thermal fusion are billions of degrees, which is, is just not realistic. Really. Yes. The significance of what we're doing really is, is picking up from the work of one of our co-founders, Professor uh, Heinrich Horror, also uh, from UNSW, who 
proposed that a non-thermal approach to fusion might work, and that might open the possibility of this hydrogen boron reaction. Okay. As history has, uh, as science has developed, lasers have come of age. Largely, the 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 discoveries that we're that we're interested in, the significance of them was marked by the the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics shared between uh, Gerard Maru and Donna Strickland mm -hmm. for the development of chirp pulse amplification lasers, which can provide uh, the powers that are needed to uh, to generate these reactions proposed by Professor Hora. Okay. So it's it's not tabletop physics. Still, you can't do that in your kitchen. You'll need some substantial equipment, access to facilities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So the you know the key that we need is is a very high powered laser, specifically a petawatt laser. Petawatt. How many zeros is that? Oh. Jesus, don't, <laughs> don't put me on the spot here, Francois. Okay, skip lot. this one. Ma many, many, many. But uh, basically, we're, we're talking about... I'll put it on screen on the, when I did the video. Okay, thanks, okay. Francois. <laughs> uh, but typically, we would be putting hundreds to a thousand joules within a nanosecond or femtosecond pulse, depending on what mm. laser that we, that we need. So one, So instead of a laser that has a stream of light, we've got a sledgehammer where we're pulsing one very, very big pulse of light. Okay. Um, and so you hope at the end of the day that this approach will y yield an exothermic reaction. That's, that's the essence of it, right? Yeah, I, I, technically I don't think it's an exothermic reaction. I technically see. it is because it obviously creates energy, yeah. but it's not a thermal reaction. The ah. purpose of the reaction is we're not generating heat. We are generating energetic charge particles by which the energy, either through the charge of the particles or the energy as they explode from the nuclear yeah. reaction is directly captured. I so see. we're not That's creating That's an important heat. difference. Yes, I see. Okay, back to entrepreneurship. Sure. Right? So you have this opportunity. Um, how big is this opportunity? Like in terms of market and access and all these things? Well, that I know it's a broad question, but... Of course, it's a very diff difficult one. And obviously it's one that when you're talking to investors, you absolutely have to quantify yeah. Uh, you know, digging into into our market research, we know that of the order of seven hundred billion dollars per year is invested on energy infrastructure, so power plants, the grid, everything else. So that I guess is the worldwide, or worldwide, yeah. So that's the the total market in theory that is is uh, you know pumped into uh, into uh, energy sources. Mm -hmm. Now that said that is not really a complete picture because the value of energy is in everything. So, you know, your iPad, iPad uh, takes a certain amount of energy just to, to produce the metals that are in it, particularly yep. aluminium. Um, when you do a Google search, I think there's something of the order of a kilojoule. Yeah, goes you into can every, boil every, every, a kettle, they say, we, for we, every we, Google for, search. For every, for every Google search that you do. Everything, everything that you use, that you see, be it powered by electricity or not, mm. has value in it that's electricity so those numbers particularly uh you know how they could be applied how it could be implemented into into other products is much much wider than that but as a sim in a simplistic sense it's you know in the orders of hundreds of billions per year okay um but there's surely there's competitors right yeah well there's uh well there's always competitors <laughs> they say that if you don't have a competitor well you probably don't have a, a market yeah, so f from the market perspective, you know, immediately our competition is other energy sources. And I think where the failings of a lot of, uh, in particular, renewable energy sources has come from is they have still not got their prices down below coal-fired power um, and therefore have not been widely adopted uh, by the world. So f without, forget the, the details of the economic, if it's more expensive than, than what you're paying for in your electricity mm -hmm. bill, mm -hmm. why would you buy it? Yes. That's that's a, an economic uh, precedent Reality, for, yeah. for ev mm -hmm. everything to, to be um, to to be uh, to be used. Do you foresee barrier of entry for you or for your potential competitor? Well, for you, say. Well, for me personally, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, barriers to entry for, for me. I, I guess in in my role, uh, you know, leading the charge on a on a fusion energy venture. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. You know, a lot of people have asked, why, why could a, a research group in Australia do this? They don't do nuclear stuff. Mm -hmm. um, why, you know, for me as an individual, I'm a material scientist, I'm not a nuclear, nuclear physicist. But essentially, 
we've managed to put together a, a, a team of researchers mm -hmm. and a scientific advisory board of very, very high profile people who essentially are behind this. Yeah, we'll which, talk about that. Yeah. Which, which, which largely get over the first hurdle of mm -hmm. do you have the technical expertise? Yeah. Um, now, beyond that, I mean, the, the economic barriers to entry, you know, of course, it's because a very it, expensive operation, but that's in what the you're long term, in the, in the, it will require tens of millions of dollars in the long term. Absolutely. Uh, do you foresee some legislative difficulties? For example, uh, nuclear, nuclear power in general, I think there's a moratorium in Australia on nuclear yep. power. Yeah. So do you foresee something like that? Probably not, because it's a clean, safe approach. Well, yeah. I mean, right now, we are, you know, if it works, it's a nuclear source of power, and that's regular. Well, that's banned in Australia, essentially, with the exception of, of the activities at Ansto. Uh, nuclear is banned. It probably listening to things in the political circles that there are efforts to try and change that, so Australia can have nuclear. Um, that said, uh, when you know, given six, you know, if, if we we achieve success and you know the widespread implementation of what we do. Uh, a lot of the reasons those regulations are there to protect the public will be less of an issue because, again, we don't have radioactive fuels, we don't have radioactive byproducts, and there's no way that we could turn this into a bomb. Okay. So those regulations likely would change yeah. in, in our favour yeah. to, yeah. to see this uh, through. So I'm, for all these reasons, I'm very impressed by the fact that you convince investors to invest in this uh, high-risk, high-reward uh, venture. Um, so congrats to you. Um, Let's talk about your proposal to the investors, right? Yeah. Just a broad brush. What did you tell them? Please invest. Please invest uh, $1 million or well, up to $1 million. Uh, we had set a minimum investment amount of 100,000 mm -hmm. because we don't want too many investors. Um, we promised the investors that we would not spend any money until we got to six hundred thousand dollars. We subsequently mm -hmm. bumped that up to a million dollars, which is why mm -hmm. the million threshold that we've just just uh, reached is important because mm -hmm. we can now spend our, our, our money. Mm -hmm. That I think is important because some of the first investors that you talk to say, "Hey, uh, how do we know that you're not going to take off with our mm -hmm. money and go and buy a boat?" Mm -hmm. um, or am I alone in this thing? Am I right? alone in this thing? Yeah. Or hang on. Has someone else done some due diligence here? Someone else really thought about it? So one of the investors put it quite nicely. Every, everyone wants to be the, the first, second investor. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the first investors, um, you know, literally said that to us. How do we know that you guys aren't a fraud? Now that we've got a whole pile of investors and we can introduce them to each other and, okay. and there's a lot more confidence yeah, yeah, in that yeah. and... That has seen a lot more investors come looking to us. looking at the, your plan though i see that you've um you foresee three phases so that's phase one it's your million dollar to start the machine running correct so there's phase two and phase three yeah yeah phase one uh you know we, we need to get a, a very detailed proposal together we need to cost or plan and cost in detail the experimental program that's going to get us to uh you know the first experiments and proof that that uh, what we're what we're doing can actually achieve net energy gain in, in the first instance. Now, there's an enormous amount of work that you have to do to get to the the even basic level of of what's expected, particularly by many venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. Have you got a shareholders agreement? Show me the license agreement. What other patents mm -hmm. are you thinking of filing? How much are all these future experiments going to cost? Mm -hmm. So that's that's not an easy thing to do, particularly when you're bootstrapping. And I say bootstrapping, you know, I, I've spent, you know, uh, several years part-time, the best part of this year, full-time working essentially for, for nothing, yes. for, for fundraising. Our co-founders, Professor Hora and, mm. and our colleagues in, in Luxembourg have, have put in several hundred thousand dollars just into patent fees alone. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a simple thing to do. Um, so getting to the stage where, where investors expect... Yeah. Uh, expect you to be is is i guess the purpose of our pre-seed round so the first million dollars to get ourselves organized mm -hmm. as it turns out we do have some opportunities to do some quick experiments so hopefully we'll be able to move the needle okay. on the science uh, fairly soon as well so briefly phase two and phase three could you put a uh, numbers on those uh 10 million dollars i won't into, you, i won't <laughs> hold you up to it but the yeah. order of 10 million dollars yeah. into phase two so that's essentially a scientific program yeah 
where we're going to prove that we can achieve net energy gain. So in the fusion world, net energy gain is the amount of energy that comes out is more than the amount of energy that you put in. And it's not something mm -hmm. that has been achieved certainly in any practical manner mm -hmm. to date. Incidentally, of all other fusion companies out there, most of which have raised several hundred million dollars, none to the best of my knowledge have achieved any reactions at all, let alone anything approaching net energy gain. Mm, yep. So the first step, uh, it, or the, the main point of stage two is proving scientifically that we can do that. Yep. The next phase is to plan the experiments to achieve net energy gain. So basically not just have it, you know, with a bunch of experiments that if you put them together shows that in principle, we can't actually show that we can achieve net energy okay. gain. Um, <clears throat> as part of this course, uh, we talk about the type of investors uh, that invest <laughs> in startup companies, venture capitalists, angel investors, private equity, meaning rich people. Yeah. Um, what's your experience? So and what was your strategy to approach them? I guess before I started this and, and as a, you know, in a previous position when, when I was working as, as a CEO of the Australian arm of Indie Labs, which was very much American and, and Australian, we had a, a, a strategy whereby we would focus on overseas investors to get the first term sheet because Australian investors typically give uh, less favorable terms than international investors where there's more competition. Mm -hmm. so that was the, the original intention. We weren't focusing on the Australian investors. Now, we had an amazing opportunity whereby we, we published some media, um, which went fantastically well, and we had literally hundreds of investors come to us, which is a position I never thought I'd be in in my wildest dreams, but it was great. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, look, let's just find the most reputable venture capital investor and just just you know, raise a bit more mm. money than we thought. Uh, that was February. Then uh, this, this coronavirus thing happened and naturally... Uh, Pandemic. The, naturally, uh, the, and understandably, the venture capitalists said, look, no new invest, investments mm. at the moment. We have to look after our own companies to make sure they don't go under. Mm. So our strategy then uh, turned to angel investors, so rich people. And particularly in Australia, what was quite nice is that there are quite a lot of those, their interests are not purely financial. They're, they're not uh, insisting that there are pathways to get their money out in the very short term. Yeah, where a long patient term investment. investors. Patient investors. And also their motivations are literally not just to make some money in a couple of years. They want to do something good for society. Okay. So in Australia, so all of our, our, our uh, round to date, our million dollars is angel investors. Um, you know, the next round we will be focusing on venture capitalists. But it's very nice that you know what has you know what has landed in our lap is a bunch of very understanding investors, very supportive investors, uh, all all which are not just interested in mm. making a buck, but also doing something for the world. That's that's the ideal position to be in. Do you think some of them have got the means to do a second round? With yes. You? So that's also comforting. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Probably uh, not as many as if they were funds, but. Uh, and will you approach at some point? In phase two, phase three, venture capitalists for larger sums of money than yeah, angel investors can. But these days, some people are so rich that they're, they're richer than some investment funds. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's both good form and, and the rules of the game that if you're raising a fund, you ask your existing investors, do they want to cover yeah, it Yeah, it's first? probably in your agreement too, that they have a first right of investment. Yep. And why would we want anyone else? Um, mm -hmm. Now, of, of, of course, then we go out to other people. Um, you know, of course, that can be other angel investors, particularly billionaires is a bit of a, you know, fusion's a bit of a trendy thing to invest in mm. at the moment. But of course, funds and, and funds, particularly if they're experienced in fusion in other, other areas of the world, uh, you know, firstly, very knowledgeable, okay. which is very important, and also understand that it's a long term, you know, more than 10 year uh, game in our case. Okay. Um, we change gear, we talk about the team, right? I think it would be fair to say that this is something that you cannot achieve on your own. Um, you're, not, you're not even a nuclear scientist yourself. I'm not even a nuclear scientist <laughs> or a laser plasma physicist. Or a rocket scientist. Um, so you have to put together a team. Tell us about the importance of this, first of all. I guess when you approach investors, it's important to say, hey, I've got a good backup. And, yeah. And 
Well, I guess I'll take one step before I was on the scene. Professor Heinrich Horror was pushing this for a very, very long time. And where it all started was, was family friends who were investment bankers of his says, hey, don't let that patent go. Um, let's bankroll that and see if we can find some people who, who know what they're doing to, to do something with yeah. it. Now, that's where I came on the scene, which is quite a few years ago now. But one thing which was obviously lacking from us, well, Professor Hora, he's 89. Um, he certainly knows his stuff and has some ama- amazing networks and certainly amazing stories growing up in Germany and having a little mm-hmm. bit you know, in, in that part of the world, uh, you know, grow, growing up, um, you know, sort of between world wars. Um, he himself clearly can't be an executive that, that takes a, an avenue like this. So yeah. he found us. But what was, what was quite clear to us is, well, you know, who's going to believe us? We've got a technology that could be another source of energy and solve the world's energy problems. It's too good to be true. Mm. So in the first instances, we needed to get people on board to... To bring add, cre- credibility to the, to the venture. Absolutely, add to credibility. But more than that, and, and that's been absolutely important that, that we got those guys involved, but more than, more than that, you know, there, this is an intersection of two areas of science. It's laser physics and nuclear physics. Fusion people really don't get the notion that you can do a non-thermal, have a non-thermal fusion reaction. Okay. The laser people do. This really is the intersection of two areas of science, and there are very, very few people who understand that. Mm-hmm. Most of those advisors are some of the few people who understand that, and having those guys on board, in my mind, as far as a barrier to entry to someone else, is as important as intellectual property, possibly more important. Yeah, if you've got everyone on, who knows this field in, in your court, uh, it's very difficult for other people to, to push, the, push the boundaries. Okay. Very good. Um, I'd like to wrap things up. Um, and I've got a little section called rapid fire questions for you. Oh, Jesus. So you can answer, <laughs> you can answer either with uh, one word or one sentence. Okay. I might ask you an explanation, but, uh, <laughs> um, from the beginning of HB 11 to today, how long? Since I, I was involved mm-hmm. two and a half years. Two and a half years to get acquainted with the people, the technology, start putting the idea together, raise the money, two and a half years. Yeah. I want the students to understand that these things take time. You know? Of course, and most of that was done, a lot of that was done while I was in my last job. And without you know, my last job support that I could do some of these things on the side, I probably wouldn't be here. Okay. Uh, how hard is rejection? Slap in the face when you raise money. That's fine. I've rejected a few investors myself. Okay. <laughs> you don't want investors who don't understand. Good, good answer, good answer. Your wife is pregnant with your third child. Are you going to su- survive all of this? I don't know. We'll find out, <laughs> I guess. Find out. Okay. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, this one is uh, related to exit scenario. Oh, yeah? We haven't talked about that because... Um, Probably uh, it's a message, it's a clear message that you should have for investors, right? Of course. But so I'm going to ask you a more personal question. If every man has his price, what's your price? (laughs) (sighs) My impression is that you're in for the adventure. I'm in for the adventure. Mm. Uh, Absolutely. Um, And and to be honest, if, if, things evolved to a point where someone it was more appropriate for someone to take over a different phase of the company, that's, that's fine. To me, it's more important to see that this actually, this actually pans out and it works. Great. I'm just leading the charge on the early days. And last question, uh, where can the audience find more info about Warren McKenzie and HB11? Well, I mean, LinkedIn, LinkedIn for, for me personally, HB11, the, the, the website, uh, hb11.energy. Um, a very new shiny website should be up in the next week. That's a domain, in a dot .energy? Yep. Oh, interesting, I didn't know that. Well, I'll put that fancy. into the lecture notes. Uh, and I would like to thank you so much for your, the, all the time you've taken. Um, and I'm sure the students will benefit greatly from this interaction. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Francois. Cheers. <laughs>